Hello, everybody. Jacob Jans here with the Writer's Workshop at Authors Publish. Today, I'm pleased to present a lecture by Naisha Davis on diversity and authenticity reading, specifically in terms of why diversity matters in publishing and the role of a, of a diversity editor, sometimes referred to as a sensitivity reader or an authenticity reader and the role that such an editor can have in the publication and the writing process. This is something that publishers are in increasingly interested in because um, they're increasingly seeking to represent work with ki characters from diverse backgrounds. This lecture is part of our monthly lecture series where we present lectures on the craft of writing and the business of publishing. Naisha Davis has worked as a diversity editor for Penguin Random House, Zagat, and many others. As a writer, she's been published in Glamour, Mike, The Huffington Post, Insider, and many other publications. She's also the digital editorial director for Bust Magazine. Naisha, thank you for being here and welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. <laughs> So am I, am I, is my screen being shared now? Yeah, you are, you are live. So, um, so can you see this PowerPoint? That, not yet. Not yet. Uh-oh, hold yet. on. So, there should be a, a share screen button. Let's see. Right at the bottom of your screen. Share screen. Okay, let's see. Yeah. And How about now? Can you see? Yeah, that's perfect. Perfect. I'm not very tech savvy, unfortunately. No, that's fine. So, um, so yeah, um, what Jacob said, we're going to be talking about diversity and authenticity in writing. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background on how I got started doing this. I kind of got started by happenstance. I had heard about this type of work a few years ago, but didn't really know how to get into it. And then I was living in Thailand at the time. And in Thailand, it's like, 12 hours ahead or something of like Eastern Standard. So I was up one night looking through like some different like boards for writers. And I saw a woman was looking for a last minute um, reader to read something for some essay that she was writing about someone else. Um, so I did that. It was for an article um, for Outside Magazine. And then I asked her to write a testimonial and she did. And then someone else saw it and then they hired me and then it just kind of snowballed from there. And I realized that, you know, I really love this type of work because even though I really love writing and editing, this feels, I don't know, I really like, what do I really like? I like being kind of like an authority on something or like, it feels more like real activism to me, I guess. Like, um, yeah, so that, how I got started and I've been doing this for about two years now and yeah so moving forward okay so the first uh thing that I think that we should talk about is you know what is diversity so when we're talking about wanting to write diverse characters in fiction or um diverse portrayals of people in our memoirs or even diversity in educational materials or marketing materials. Um, we're talking about different, the, uh, like a, a, a certain, we're talking about different types of differences, not just one thing. So that can be race and ethnicity, uh, sexual orientation, age, um, nationality, place of origin, gender, uh, physical, um, and mental abilities, um, maybe if, you know, someone's in, you know, someone who uses a wheelchair or something like that, or um, if someone has, you know, deals with some type of mental health issue. Uh, you can even talk about political beliefs or religion or spiritual values. So these are some different um, things to think about when you're talking about um, diversity, I guess. Um, so um, 
question was I going to say next? Um, when it comes to this, um, I think sometimes people think that, I, or they kind of wonder like, there's not a checklist necessarily. So you don't have to, you know, hit every bullet point, but you need to be thinking about how, how you're going to mirror real life, how you're going to mirror your real culture and not just how you view the world or, you know, the type of culture you want to, um, you know, highlight. So you have to kind of, um, they say, I think the best way to do this is to also think about how you, how you, who, who, you know, and what, you know, what they say is like, write what you know. So this also, um, can be, uh, applied here. And um, so there's all these different statistics, of, of course, I'm sure you know about like why diversity and nonfiction and fiction um, is important about, um, I'm not, I didn't really look up a lot of st stats about that, but we can get a, into a little talk about like, you know, uh, how it helps self-esteem and how it helps, um, you know, to uplift and respect and um, different cultures and backgrounds and things like that. So um, what it comes down to is humanizing people. Everyone wants their story told authentically. Everyone wants to, you know, feel like they have a voice and like someone isn't, you know, just assigning them a voice or a place. And, um, so this is just a little, I think this actually links to a, a uh, something else, but um, books with diverse characters validate and humanize people in groups that are often stereotyped or overlooked in society and different art forms, popular culture. Um, so it's just important for not only the individual, but I think it's important to have in order to have like a real well rounded and fleshed out idea and respect of different cultures, different people and who we are in whatever society we live in. And um, when it comes to things like books, media, TV, music, um, those are things that are easily accessible to all of us, but also uh, particularly for instance to youth. So it's, um, I don't think I need to talk too, too much about why accurate and respectful um, representations in media, you know, are important to us. Mm, let's see. Um, and I'm going to be talking mainly about fiction and nonfiction because that's kind of what I work with. But this can extend to, like I said, marketing materials. Uh, videos, photos, uh, things like that. Um, to piggyback on what I was just saying, this is a uh, little stat from the Cooperative Children's Book Center um, about the about the types of children's books that have been uh, historically published. And this says in 2019, books about white children monsters and animated characters, including, you know, food, cars, trucks, animals, um, things that are not human, other, other human um, humans represented about 71% of children and YA books published that year. Um, so basically that means that that kind of, um, there's actually, I wanted to talk about something else. Um, that kind of goes into like the, what we were just talking about with the like dehumanizing aspect. Um, this is kind of, maybe a lot of people haven't thought about it th this way, but um, this can be used as a way to kind of other and dehumanize um, uh, people of color in uh, some, some forms of media. And, um, 
well, I have some notes, I guess. Let me look at my notes. Um, there, this has been, I'm going back to movies as well, talking about um, movies and television, because I think that sometimes um, that can be a good way to, if you're familiar with, the, with these, um, these things. But um, this has happened not just in, you know, children's books, but this happens in um, films like, uh, there was a film called, uh, was it the prince, not the princess and the P. It was, um, uh, I forget what it was called, but um, the princess and the frog, um, which was, uh, I, I believe Disney's first black uh, Disney princess. And she spent most of the movie as a frog and um, other movies like um, the movie that just came out with Jamie Foxx as the voice, I think it was called Soul. Uh, spoiler alert, uh, <laughs> he falls into a manhole and is in a coma for most of the movie. And then it's like his soul gets trapped into like a cat or, um, you know, the emperor's new groove. And there's a lot of other different um, examples of this need to, I don't really want to get into the psychology of it because I'm not a psychiatrist or anything like that. But um, that's something to think about and something I wanted to talk about, I guess. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so when it comes to um, hiring a diversity, oh, a diversity, um, I kind of think there are some things that you need to think about first, right? So there's like some pre-work that you should probably be doing. So this pre-work can be different depending on what you're doing. If you're doing something like historical fiction, um, you might be looking at um, biographies, autobiographies of people, um, you know, utilizing museums, articles, uh, case studies, things like that. If you're doing more of um, like memoir or something that's more nonfiction, if you're doing more memoir, I guess, for something like that, or maybe even fiction, if you're kind of maybe, um, if you're writing outside of your own, you know, background, you can also maybe not bother your friends, but speaking to people uh, from that group or demographic is a good uh, thing for you to do. So doing some real on the ground, I guess, research in like whatever background that you're, you're, um, you, you plan to be writing about or creating content about. Um, so that's what you're going to, I think, need to do beforehand or during the process, or at least be willing to at some point know that that's going to need to be part of your process. So when you hire a diversity editor, editor, it's not just them telling you what's wrong and then you deleting it or something like that. There should be an element and you should be ready for an element of education on your part. Um, so, uh, we want to also think about, um, when we're creating maybe characters, for instance, clear and thought out descriptions. Um, this means naming your characters correctly. Um, if you're, I, if you're, you know, what, what are these, what are these people's backgrounds? You know, um, is this character named Malcolm because his parents, you know, really love Malcolm X and this and that, or is he named uh, Joseph after his, his father's big cousin who came home from Vietnam and drank himself to death? Um, like, make sure that if you're creating characters, you're really giving them a backstory and like, fleshing them out so they can not be one dimensional. Um, when it comes to naming characters, 
um, you know, there's, you know, different cultures do names differently. And um, maybe um, when it comes to naming, you can do some, this is where the research comes in. Maybe looking up, you know, what were popular names, you know, this year that this character it was going to be born in, in this country or this culture, um, things like that. Uh, and also I have seen something with some of the fiction writers that I worked with where they kind of um, fashion their characters of color or of a minority after another fictional character. So maybe something like, um, I want this uh, black guy character to be kind of in the vein of uh, Terry Crews on Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Well, he, that's already uh, just a character in itself. So you're not really creating, if you're not really being um, authentic to the real experience of, for instance, a black man, if you're already starting with it by trying to base your character or your new character off of a fictional character that you don't know. Um, so that goes back to the whole white, write what you know. Um, and um, I could go on and on. I can talk about, you know, colorism. <laughs> Uh, and things like that. Um, the next little to the box we have is, um, you know, like I said before, diversity isn't just one thing. Uh, try to include different types of diversity and you really just want it to mirror real life um, and not just have people in stereotypical situations. You don't want to just be having like the black best friend or like I don't know, the nerdy Asian or whatever stereotypes and tropes or, you know, in TV, you'll see, I don't know, you don't want, you want, you don't want to place them in places where they're just going to be like, um, it's going to be, do a disservice to them. And it's just going to be kind of like reinforcing uh, different stereotypes and tropes and things like that. Um, so, if you cannot, you know, if researching on your own and figure, trying to figure this out, you know, on your own isn't enough, or you, um, then you can go to hiring a diversity consultant. And um, that's someone like me. And that person can kind of either, some people can do like a coaching or they can just kind of read through, if they have the lived experience, if they have the education, the background, that can be um, a good place to start. If you don't have the time maybe to do all of that on your own or you don't know where to start. Um, so many people don't know where to start. It's not that they are you know, against it, um, but they don't know where to start when it comes to you know, their blind spots and, you know, how you should be talking about this and that. And we're just people. So um, thankfully, this is now becoming a thing in, you know, writing and film and things like that. Oh, so this was um, something I had show, I had, um, put up. Um, this was just kind of a fun little cartoon about um, what well, I was talking about earlier about how Black characters never can really be their original selves in films. And they kind of end up changing into something else. Uh, if you receive the link to this afterwards, it'll like link to the original Instagram post uh, there. Um, so what do sensitivity readers do? So they read or edit for unconscious bias. So those are just um, assumptions about we, that we have about each other as people based on stereotypes. So like, um, for instance, um, black guys are good at basketball. Chinese kids are good at math. Um, 
and I don't have any stats or something like that. You can look these these. You can look more if you want um, more information about this. You can look this up yourself. <laughs> but um, those are these little assumptions that people might have that they might have grown up with, and they don't really. They might not have really questioned. Um, girls are bad at math. That yeah, that's a thing that um you know, I remember hearing, um, and some people are like disputing it now, like that stereotype that girls are bad at math and things like that. Um, uh, stereotypes in general, uh, problematic and unrealistic language. So maybe trying to use African American vernacular in your writing, but not getting it correct, or because you're not African American, or you don't you didn't grow up speaking, you know, uh, ebonics or whatever. Um, or it could be something like. Um, misreading or misinterpreting some type of religious text uh, if you're writing about a different religion other than your own. Um, it could be the, the language that you use to describe your characters. Um, so like some bad language or bad descriptions that we wouldn't want to use, but that I have seen or read or seen, like kind of like things like, um, almond shaped eyes, Asian eyes, Latin cheekbones. Uh, I don't know, um, calling black people or other brown people like food, like kind of like um, comparing them to food, saying things like uh, their skin was as dark as the cacao chocolate bar I ate last week on my cheat meal or something like that. <laughs> um, so um, those are some, um, some uh, what was I gonna say? Some examples of, you know, language that a sensitivity reader might be looking out for. And um, let me tell you, that might sound wild, but I have literally read stuff like this. Uh, and I always think like, when I'm reading it, like this is gonna be the first time where I'm gonna turn it back in and I'm gonna be like, nothing's wrong with it, but there's always something. And people have all different types of, everyone grew up differently and <laughs> people have all different types of ways that they use language and everything that they think is or is not appropriate. So, um, and then there's just, of course, the misrepresentation of cultures, history, ideas, um, I've seen this a lot, for instance, with like educational materials. So educational materials, for instance, might um, start off kind of like, um, instead of talking about, I don't know, uh, Cherokee people here in America um, and their history, it'll start with like, these people met Europeans in 1598 and then it'll like circle back around. So this kind of um, glorifying of uh, European and white culture and um, simplifying or like um, minimizing uh, cultures of color. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, so now we have common issues writers have, people have when writing outside of their viewpoint. So these are some issues that I have commonly seen that people have um, when they come to me. So the, uh, the issues with the savior complex. So the savior complex, if you're not familiar with it, um, is this complex that's in writing and probably in the world too, uh, or in the world, but we're talking about writing, writing and films where kind of like, um, usually it's, if we're talking about like the dominant culture, a lot of this is, has to do with race and with what I'm talking about right now. So it's like, um, maybe like a white person will like teach someone how to read. Like um, this like movie, a movie like Dangerous Minds or um, The Blind Spot or Finding Forrester or um, The Green Mile. Uh, well, those are, those are white, um, that's something else, but like a savior, um, the other, not the green mob, but the other ones I was talking about. Um, and then that goes into white guilt. 
So um, the whole, the white guilt issue, um, uh, kind of feeling maybe writing as if they're feeling sorry for whoever, um, regardless of if they necessarily need to be or if someone is looking for your pity or not. Um, exoticizing or dehumanizing. So that goes back to like the skin color thing, like calling, like the, how we're describing people, um, the features that we're using, um, the language that we're using, um, calling people of color or calling different types of cultures magical, for instance. Um, and um, just creating flat one dimensional characters that don't really represent, you know, true life, I guess. Um, let's see, did I have anything else? Uh, let's see. Okay, so when it comes to hiring a diversity editor and I guess writing, deciding if you're gonna be writing outside of your own experience, um, is this story mine to tell, you know, and that's something that I had to learn as, you know, a memoir writer, I write about my life, but it's like, is this story mine to tell, or am I telling someone else's story without their, you know, their consent or whatever? And it's the same here. Is this story yours to tell? Why are you writing this? Why do you want to write this? Um, do you do you read and engage um, in this background outside of this? Uh, do people need to be hearing what you have to say about this? Um, is your you know you could be very well knowledgeable about something, but does the world need your opinion on this this topic, um, especially depending on you know, I guess how how in need your piece of writing or your work is of a diversity editor. Um, and when you're thinking about this quest, this question, like the bigger question, is this story mine to tell connects to is, are you taking from someone else's plate? Basically, could this story be told better by someone from that background? Um, I think that that is the thing that you, those are the things that you should be thinking of first and foremost when you are beginning to write um, and when you are looking to hire a diversity editor. Um, so basically other questions would be, you know, what are your motivations for doing this? Um, and if you're, yeah, basically that's what, that's, what, that's what it is. What are your motivations for doing this? Um, okay, what an authenticity reader is not. An authenticity reader is not here to argue with you. Uh, people, be liking, people like to argue sometimes. Um, I don't, I'm not gonna say that I am the authority on anything, but, um, be ready to have an open mind um, and know that I, how I, some people want to kind of be proven or go back and forth and read some type of like middle ground. But for me, how I work is I'm here to do the job, point the things out, give you the resources, explain the resources and how explain it to you. And then you can decide what you're going to do with that information. But I'm not interested in and like um, playing some tug of war or like trying to convince you that this phrase or that phrase is racist or that we're not all just, you know, special snowflakes now. So we're not here to argue with you. Um, we are not ghostwriters or copy editors. Uh, so there's not going to be, do not expect regular old copy editing when it comes to this. Don't necessarily expect rewriting, like heavy rewriting. I think that is going to be something 
a little bit different. Um, what we're looking for are the problematic instances. Um, we are not volunteers. This should be paid work. This is paid work because you're not just paying for someone to point this out or say this or say that. Um, actually, as the worst off the piece is, or the manuscript or whatever it is, the more labor it's going to be because I have to go, I'm not just saying this is wrong. I am finding information to back up why this is wrong or why this needs to be changed or whatever. I'm explaining it. And then I probably will have to maybe break out with you and have a Zoom and maybe explain it some more perhaps. You're also paying for the um, what they say, the emotional labor of it all and how this can be triggering to some people. Uh, so please make sure that you treat this um, respectfully. And, you know, this is not a volunteer position. Um, an authenticity reader does not uh, represent everyone. Um, I represent myself. I can give insight to, but it's not a check off like, oh, Naisha said this is okay, so that's okay. Um, we don't represent, we're not, we don't represent just every, everybody. Um, what one culture, it, it's, it's completely individual. So just know that. And um, I think that a lot of people um, have some issues with thinking that, is this censorship? Am I being censored? And I don't like to think of it as censorship because we're not censoring anything. We're merely, we're literally merely suggesting and educating. And from there, it's up to you. And if you're working with a publisher to decide if you're going to take those to suggestions, how many of them you're going to take, how you're going to implement those, how you're going to change, and then you're still in control. Um, some tips on how to get the most out of your reading is to be open-minded. Remember, you don't have all the answers. Um, understand the emotional strain that this might have on the person doing the reader, doing the reading. And of course, like I said, to read and do your own research um, and to read whatever notes they have um, for you. So let's see um, what to look for when hiring a diversity reader. Um, a lot of people, there isn't necessarily training in this. There's training in like diversity and inclusion, anti-racism. Um, there's training in teaching. I used to go volunteer and like teach like gender, dis not gender discrimination, like gender differences and about like LGBT like issues to um, to like uh, community organizations and schools and things like that. So there's a lot of I say that to say there's a lot of lived experience that can um, happen. I can't tell. I can't be a reader for I don't know Judaism. I can't be a reader for being, I don't know, second generation Jamaican or something or whatever. So there's a lot of lived experience. I'm gonna be wanting to make sure that the person you're hiring has the experience and the background that you're looking for. Um, what type of educational training on the topic do they have? Um, do they have training on that topic? Um, do they have, have they you know, gone through some type of I don't know, diversity in this or I don't know, whatever else. Uh, sorry, that's not a good uh, <laughs> explanation. And of course, um, this is more of a like a duh type of thing, but like a, or like a straightforward type of thing. Testimonials, who, 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 who is this person brand new? Or like who else vouches for them? Who have they worked for? That's like a, um, I wanna tell you to do that because when you, there isn't like, this is kind of like an emerging thing. So just, you know, keep it simple. You can also, does this person have a website? Do they have testimonials? What's their footprint online, you know? Um, when to hire. So this is a question that I have seen asked 
when to hire a diversity consultant at what point. So when I'm working with an independent author, it seems that they either want, they have written it and they have their draft and they're getting ready to try to send it out to agents or something like that. So they're, seeing, they're, hi, they're hiring me at that point. Um, I have had some people reach out to me um, to do like a, like a, almost like a, like a re-edit, not a re-edit, like um, they're doing like a revamp of uh, materials, like a, an audit, for instance, or um, they might want coaching. Some people want like some type of coaching throughout or like a, a like a, some sessions that they can go through. Um, when I'm working with a publisher, the, they tend to bring it to me, it seems right before the copy editing, like the final copy edit or something like that. Um, and I've also had uh, independent, well, I've also had authors who were with, a, who did have a book deal, but maybe they didn't have that in their budget to do it. So they were bringing it to me around that process because they were, they were doing it out of pocket or something like that. Um, which also brings me to like publishers, if you should probably be like putting aside some money for this and, and like building it, bu building this into your budgets for some titles and things like that, just so you guys know, this shouldn't really f fall on the, if you're, if they have like a deal with you all, the, I don't think that this should fall on the, uh, the writer necessarily. Uh, but I don't, I'm not like, I don't run anything by my mouth, so. Um, and how to find a diversity reader. So, um, okay, you can do, do it very simply. Um, Twitter, Instagram, you can type in hashtags like hashtag sensitivity reader, hashtag diversity reader, hashtag diversity and inclusion coach, things like that. And then that will, of course, bring that up. Um, you can also do that in LinkedIn. You can look up that like sensitivity reader, a diversity reader, and it'll bring up people who maybe have that in their headline, for instance. Um, you can sign up. This is a sign up form for binders full of sensitivity readers. You can uh, request a reader. These are paid. You have to negotiate the fee with them. But um, this is another option for uh, finding a sensitivity reader. And then there's other um, sites like Salt and Sage, which has, I believe, a database, a database of indie diversity readers. Um, so those are a few different ways to find. And me, of course. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is some of my info. And th these are not all the areas of expertise that I have, but these are just some of them. I just want to give you like a little taste. But um, that's all, that's what I have. So um, thank you. Should I stop the share? Let's see. Here, I've got it. Naisha, oh, thank you so much. Um, that was wonderful. You gave a lot of really um, good ideas and I love that you included um, links directly to places people can find diversity readers and everybody who's watching will be sending out um, the links after the presentation. So you'll all be able to um, be able to click directly on those and if you're interested in finding a diversity reader, that should hopefully make it a lot um, easier. Um, I do have a lot of questions that I think I could ask you. We could, I'm sure, talk about this for a very long time. Um, one question I have is, if someone is interested in becoming a diversity reader, do you have any advice for them? Besides to just, uh, well, the, the, the big advice is to figure out what um, you're going to be, you know, giving your readings on. So like, what are your topics and areas of interest? So that's the biggest yeah. one. Um, and then as far as like getting it out there, you could, um, it would be as far as getting a gig in marketing, I guess. So you could sign up for, for instance, some of these, um, these databases or what have you. Um, you can maybe start writing about the subject a little bit or doing videos about the subject. Um, and what else? 
how else? I was going to say something else. I forgot. Write about the subject. Uh, I don't know. I think those are. Yeah. These sound like standard marketing practices yeah. to get your name out there. Yeah, for, to be honest. I mean, it's not, I mean, it's not, I don't know. Yeah, th those are standard marketing practices, I would say, to try to do that. Okay. But yeah, niche down and market. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe you can volunteer for someone. Maybe there's something or someone like um, a service that, or a person, maybe you have a homie or something that, mm -hmm. you know, you can volunteer for them and do something for them and they can write you a testimonial. It seems like you, that first testimonial you got made a really big difference in terms of being able to turn this into something you do. Yes, for sure. Um, so can you talk a little bit, uh, because you've, you've, you've said you do this a lot for nonfiction. Um, what, can you talk more about um, sensitivity reading for nonfiction and maybe a little bit how that's different for fiction? Um, how is it different from fiction? Um, I guess with the nonfiction, you're dealing with, if I'm dealing with someone who's writing like memoir, for instance, so there's, it's from their memory, right? Memoir. Yeah. And then it's also their emotions and, you know, their background. So just dealing with the person and how they're going to be responding or interacting with the writing is different. Uh, and then maybe the way that they are talking about a culture uh, and how they have interacted with the culture. Yeah. Um, so you're, you're writing, you don't want to, if you're, someone's writing a story about their real life, you know, you're not going to be like, oh, this, I don't want to be like, change this if it, if, if, because it might offend someone, but like write about it in a nuanced way, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, so you're not just writing like, you, you have to kind of um, give the culture or the whoever that you're writing kind of like a respect and that's outside of who you are or that's um, outside of your viewpoint, I guess. Yeah, I think that makes sense because, I mean, if you're writing a memoir, it is primarily usually about your own experience, right? But you're still interacting with other people who have their own lived experiences and you don't want to make the other, like, like in a novel, you don't want to make the other people one dimensional. So just doing that, you, you think just doing the same research and developing that understanding of the other people you're writing about, that's. That's definitely helpful. Um, understanding how they're, they, they're fitting into your story and yeah, understanding how they're fitting into your story and what, what type of, what type of statement you're making by using them in your story. Mm hmm Okay. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. Um, a lot of people, I think, spend a lot of time talking about descriptions of skin color. Um, is there anything you, you can say that would be helpful on that? Mm -hmm. um, I would say, um, I should have done some slides on it, but I didn't. But basically, like, um, I did some research and it's kind of like, it suggested that, well, I guess I would suggest you learn about colors in general. So, uh, you know, there's not just brown, there's different types of brown, right? There's not just pink, there's different types of pink. We don't have just, I don't just have brown skin. I have like a brown brown skin with a such and such undertone. Yeah. Uh, or this person has whatever skin with a pink undertone or a blush or this or that. So learning about colors in general and using different modifiers to describe skin tone. So like dark brown, uh, light brown, uh, you know, blue black, or, you know, just using different modifiers, but never just dark. You yeah. can't just say okay. dark, that dark girl over there, you, n never just dark. Mm -hmm. Okay. And is this a, the type of thing where you hire someone from a background, like a black person, would you ask them, like, they would just say, this is not how black people talk about their own skin color? Um, if I were talking about that, I mean, I guess it would be, that would be depending on who that person is. Um, are we talking about different cultures? Like the African-American culture is different than like 
don't know, Haitian culture or oh, something. Yeah. We're both black, but that 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 might be different. That those things will be different. That's why I said it would be up to the individual. But mm -hmm. yeah, I could say um, this is not how a black person talks about our skin tone, or this is not how we like our skin tone to be spoken about. Um, and if it comes to maybe someone else, like if maybe there, I'm if I'm doing a reading for like people of color in general, and maybe it has some someone else, I might have to do some research on this yeah. and do, be, do like, this is the, this is what I found, read this and then make your own whatever from, the, from here. Okay, yeah, that's helpful, thank you. Um, so it seems to like, seems to me there's a lot of different reasons to hire a diversity editor. And I really, I think a lot of people, um, they want to, and have more diversity in their stories, but they often just feel stuck in terms of how to do that. And I think you said at the beginning of the of the talk that that is often a good time to talk to someone like you. Do you think that's like one of the ways people can think about that? Um, if they're feeling stuck or like they don't know, you know, just, where to start. Yeah, for sure, definitely. Yeah. Um, Definitely, but also like reading and consuming um, literature and um, media by and for whatever culture or whatever background is also um, important as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, do you have any um, recommended resources or books or places for people to start who want to learn more about um, these ideas of diversity? Uh, uh, no, <laughs> there are, there, I, I came across some, uh, some things like some, um, some different types of tests um that were kind of like the unconscious bias test it was something like um yeah. that, that like harvard does or something like that so there's all different types of like little um tests and games that you can do um but like without saying any uh thing there was a book what was i called um i forget what it was called but basically youtube is your friend um looking up there are books that oh who's that woman jane Jane something, the teacher woman. Th that doesn't help. <laughs> yeah. um, Jane Elliott, she's an anti-racism activist and diversity educator. She's known for doing the blue eye, brow, blah, brown eye exercise um, way Jane back Jane Elliott. Then. Yeah, Jane Elliott. Okay. So looking, for instance, at some of her work and um, reading up um reading up on different websites um like everyday Femi feminism or mm -hmm. um reading they have articles on like very well health and things like that that you can go on to and learn about um things like that just um even reading uh on like like official organization websites like i don't know just doing real like real research to be quite honest yeah it seems like so much of this is just about honest and authentic representation where you get outside of just the one-dimensional representation of characters yes 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 i agree um i know as someone who consumes a lot of media like you can sometimes see these negative tropes coming and it makes it for an unpleasant viewing experience. And I think it's especially true for people who are like from the same background of those characters where those negative tropes are going to be happening. And I, I don't think most creators intend um, for that to happen, but like you gotta find a way to be aware of these tropes, right? Uh -huh. When you're- Yeah, and I think that also along with that, is like the idea of like it's not just about having one like one person or like 
one whatever, like having the variety of different people creating different mm -hmm. types of work about, you know, being black or being LGBT or about, you know, trans or about whatever else. Yeah. That that's something I, I see in publishing is a publisher says we need to have more black people. So there's a like a book that is about the black experience. And I, I wish it was just more like about normal lives and mm -hmm. they happen to be of that background. Yeah, like it is not made the, the whole, uh, it's not always about, you know, the struggle or the whatever. It's just yeah. about them living life and they just happen to be whoever. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's something I find to be frustrating about the publishing industry now, but that's not all there is, of course, but that seems like one of the pitfalls um yeah we were re recently watching a television show on netflix and it featured a character who was disabled and i started to get this sense that the disabled character would soon be healed of their disability this is a trope that happens a lot um and then it turns out that was true and of course the problem with that is the implication is that you can't be a whole person as, as a disabled person, which of course is ridiculous. <laughs> but these, these things keep being portrayed over and over and people don't consciously realize that that's the message, right? Yeah, I sometimes wonder though, if, it, if they do consciously realize it and that's like part of like, I don't know, whatever, it's whatever, you know, agenda they have. Yeah. Um, I think the, the, it, the, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. It could be, it could be for yeah. somewhere in the middle. I mean, you hope for, for one form of truth, but that's not always the case, right? Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, so I know you also work as an editor um, for Bust Magazine. Is that right? Yes. And um, is it, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. So um, if you don't know what Bust Magazine is, it's a lifestyle feminist publication. Uh, it's independently published. Uh, it's been around since about 1993, and um, yeah, they they do a print issue six times a year. And I am I oversee the web, so I decide, you know, <laughs> what goes on the web and the the, the 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 direction. And I work with our freelancers and then our interns, and um, I love it. I've been a fan of them for since I was a teenager and they got me through a, a lot when I was a kid and um, just learning about different types of music and ideals and things like that, that I wasn't, uh, I didn't have growing up. Um, so yeah, that's what I do and I love it. Is, is that's one of your main, main gigs? Well, it's, I'm only part time. Yeah, that's uh. publishing industry, right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's the, the, it's the, the, the main, I've only been there since July, but hmm. I've, um, I've freelanced for them on and off. And I interned with them when I was, uh, you know, fresh out of uni and yeah. So, um, bus.com going over there. Our new next issue is out on the 31st. So yeah. That's great. Um, and if somebody wants to work with you as a diversity editor for their work. Um, is that something you do? Yes, it is. <laughs> I do that a lot uh, for, in, for, I work a lot one-on-one -on -one with people mm -hmm. and um, yeah, it is something I do. And, and they can, they can go to your website. Um, yes. My website is called brownandabroad.com. Very easy. Um, there should be a link to sensitivity readings. There's also a contact form. Um, as well. And you can just get in contact with me that way. And there's, you know, a page that tells a little bit more and has my testimonials, of course. Yeah, that's, is there anything um, you want, you want people to think about at the end of this lecture? Mm -hmm. last, Besides last thinking think. about, is this your story to tell? <laughs> Is this your story to tell? Um, and does the world need you to tell this story? Think about that as well. And I think that's it. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Naisha. Thank you. And thank you everybody for being here today. 
Um, if you have any questions for me, you can reach me at support at authorspublish.com. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye.